So we're going to continue in our series on the Gospels. If you missed part one, last week we looked at the literary composition of the Gospels with a particular reference to Matthew, Mark and Luke, which are the synoptic Gospels, which simply means to be seen together. We looked at some of the the striking similarities between the three Gospel writers' accounts, uh, which also leads to what are the differences between the three of them and why did that come to be. Now, what we're going to do today is take a bit of a step back and consider the world that Jesus actually lived in, that just like me and you today, Jesus lived in a real world, in a real historical setting, in a real cultural context. Last uh, last time we had a look at the different gospel authors and considered their context, who they were writing to. Now we want to take a broader step back and say, okay, what was the world actually like that Jesus did his ministry within? Now to do this, one of the great places that we can actually start is at the beginning of the Passion Week. And if you've never heard that expression, it simply refers to the week between Jesus's triumphant entry in in Jerusalem, I was gonna say Joondalup, uh, but his triumphant entry in Jerusalem all the way through to his crucifixion upon the cross and later resurrection. Now, Jesus arrives into Jerusalem. If you've read the story or heard it told before, he's on on a little donkey and as he arrives, Jerusalem is filled with Jewish believers who are gathered for Passover. And as Jesus is arriving, they lay down palm fronds to to signify the importance of this moment. Now, there's a lot of things that are happening around this great picture of Jesus's triumphant entry to Jerusalem. And there's a couple of forces that we need to think about. N.T. Wright in his book, Simply Jesus, describes it as the perfect storm in in the cultural setting that Jesus finds himself. In. And two of the people groups that we need to consider in this moment is Rome and Israel. And then later we're going to take a look at Jesus himself and what God is doing universally in this same moment. So as a starting point, let's think about Rome. Now, in the few hundred years before Jesus was born, Rome became the superpower of the ancient world. It's empire spreading from Egypt through to Germany. That through conquest, uh, the the Roman way of life spread throughout much of the ancient world. Now, one of the key Roman figures that most of us would recognize is Julius Caesar. And around 30 years before the birth of Jesus, Julius returns back to Rome with the entire Roman army, which was a real power move, which the rest of the Roman Senate really responded to. Now, up until this point, Rome was a democracy and the Senate and their governance responded quickly and powerfully to anyone who tried to rise above that shared governance. And they viewed Julius as doing exactly this as he brought his army back into the capital of Rome. So shortly after, he was assassinated by his, uh, <laughs> by I guess, those that, that didn't like the position of power that Julius was taking. Now, Julius, in, uh, in the, the, the months leading up to his death, actually allowed the people of Rome to start believing that he had become divine, that he was divine, that he was godlike in what he'd been able to achieve, which is perhaps what pr- uh, prompted his opponents to assassinate him, that he allowed the people of Rome to believe that he was more than a great Caesar, that he was actually divine. Now, Julius's death led to a a period of civil war within Rome until eventually Octavian, who became known as Augustus Caesar, which was Julius's adopted son, became the new Caesar of Rome. He united the empire and became more like a king and he became more like a central point of leadership for all of Rome. Now, there's something really important that Augustus did during this time as well. He affirmed the divine nature of his father, Julius. And so in one sense, he became the son of God. And in that period of history, if you were to ask anyone in the Roman world who the son of God was, their answer would have been Octavian. Augustus Caesar, he is the son of the divine Julius. He is the son of God. It would have been the politically accurate answer. And in the Roman world, it would have been the answer that most people would have expected. This is interesting when we consider in just a few decades time, the message that Jesus would bring. So we have Augustus leading Rome now, and he carries this mantle of the divine. Uh, alongside his uh, his position of leadership uh, nationally within Rome, he also sets himself up as what would be like the chief priest. So he has this spiritual leadership within the Roman Empire as well. 
Now, this is a, around the time when Jesus is being born as a, as a becoming a transition in Roman leadership. And when Jesus is a, in his early teens, Tiberius Caesar takes on the new role of the leadership of Rome. Tiberius was the son of Augustus and Tiberius continued to take on the divine titles of his father. And Tiberius in particular became known as the son of the divine. Now, Tiberius is the emperor of Rome while Jesus is getting started in his public ministry. And there's a great story that that brings these two worlds together, the world uh, of Rome and the world of Israel and Jesus. So shortly after Jesus arrives into Jerusalem, I I described that picture of the triumphant entry with the donkey. Jesus arrives in Jerusalem and then someone asks him the question, should we pay our taxes to Caesar? So part of what it meant to live under Roman law was that for Israel, they paid taxes to the governance of Rome and tax collectors would collect that and they weren't super loved as we've discussed previously. So Jesus has asked the question and he's handed a coin. Should we pay taxes to Caesar? Now the, the picture that Jesus saw on that coin was that of Tiberius Caesar. And the inscription upon the coin would read, son of the divine Augustus. So isn't this an interesting moment that the son of God, Jesus, holds this coin with a picture of Tiberius Caesar with the inscription, son of the divine. I could imagine Jesus almost chuckling at that. And then of course he answers the question by saying, give to Caesar, what is Caesar? Give to God, what is God? So so this kind of picture just captures the Roman world and the world of faith and Christ coming together. Now what's interesting about the, the Roman ideology is that they believed that in their their conquest, they were bringing the blessings of Rome to the world, that they were actually making the world a better place, that they had a divine authority to make the world better by a higher power that which was the Caesars. It sounds a little bit familiar to God's people Israel, that they, they were called to be blessed, to be a blessing to the whole world. And here is Rome in its own way through conquest doing that same thing. So here's Rome as we see Jesus at the center uh, of this cultural storm around him. Rome believing that they are the ones to bring divine hope to the world, that they are the ones that follow the divine leadership of Tiberius Caesar, that they are the ones that should ultimately be in control. Then on the other side, we have Israel. Now we have crowds and crowds of Jewish people gathered around Jesus at the triumphant entry. As I mentioned, they're laying down those palm thrones, which was a really significant symbolic gesture. Now the palm was a symbol of Jewish nationalism. And if we're gonna understand what's going on in the Jewish mindset in this moment, there's a really important moment in their history that we need to look back to. And that is of the Exodus. So the Israelites in their ancient history found themselves in captivity in Egypt under, again, a foreign power who was oppressing them. They were slaves in Egypt under Pharaoh and they desired their own freedom. And of course, what happens? God raises up a hero named Moses who leads them out of Egypt through the miraculous provision of God. So God does great miracles in the eyes of all of Egypt, in the eyes of the Pharaoh, and through God's, mirac- through God's miracles and his chosen hero, Moses, the chains are broken, their freedom is restored, and they're able to leave Egypt through God's miraculous power. Now, there are several, several other moments in Israel's history where, where similar kind of things happen. We don't have time to touch on all of them. But this mindset that they had, that God ultimately was moving to restore their national power and significance and restore the promises that they believed were theirs. So when they see Jesus arrive on this donkey and, that donkey and they lie down symbols of Jewish nationalism, what might they be thinking? They're thinking that Jesus is our chosen hero, that Jesus is going to move in the miraculous provision of God to break the chains of Roman oppression so that we can be free, so that we can govern ourselves and we can be God's promised people blessed to be a blessing. Here was the cultural expectation, the spiritual expectation of the Jewish community. So we have Rome, their understanding of who they were, Israel, their understanding of what the Messiah would do and bring on their behalf. And then we have Jesus on a little donkey riding into Jerusalem. So we've talked about Rome, we've talked about Israel, 
But then what is God through the Son doing in this moment? Rome is thinking about the immediate five to ten years in front of them. Israel's thinking the same. What might Jesus do for us in the years ahead? But God's thinking about a more eternal truth. God's thinking about what Christ will do upon the cross once and for all. And this is where it gets fun for us as modern day readers of God's word, that everyone around Jesus thinks this moment is about that time and about that space. But the great truth of what Jesus does upon the cross, through the cross and through the resurrection is not about ancient Israel. It's not about ancient Rome. It's about every person that will ever be born that they might come to know the love of God through their Savior, who on one day and one moment rode into Jerusalem in the middle of Passover. No one understood what was happening, but God had a plan that includes each one of us. So when we think about the world that Jesus lived in, we think about the forces that are shaping everything that he's met with. We have to also remember that everything through this story is actually about God's heart for me and about God's heart for you.